Welcome to People Who Perform, the Real Estate Careers Podcast. Each episode will bring you conversations from business leaders and up and coming stars in the commercial real estate industry in Canada. Our guests will share their unique career journeys, passions, and advice on what it takes to be successful in this industry. This podcast is brought to you by Highview Partners, connecting people who perform in Canadian real estate. I'm your host, Nicola Denning-Miller, and today I have the pleasure of connecting you with Teresa Warner. Teresa is Senior Vice President, Retail and Asset Resilience at Kingset Capital, where she's responsible for the operations, execution and value creation strategies across their portfolio, primarily focusing on the retail assets. In addition, her responsibilities include the execution of their sustainability and building technology strategies. Prior to joining Kingset Capital in 2013, she spent 17 years at Ivanhoe Cambridge, most recently as Vice President, National Asset Management and Operations Information. In 2014 and 15, she co-chaired the ICSC's Canadian Convention held in Toronto. And since 2015, she's been a board member with BOMA Toronto and in 2019 joined their executive committee as treasurer. She's an inspiring, humble, passionate, and truly engaging senior leader. So, Teresa, thank you so much for joining me today. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Oh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really looking forward to this. Wonderful. I bet you didn't realize that you were going to be a podcast guest, and I certainly didn't realize that I was going to turn into a podcast host these last few months during COVID. Oh, I, I think there's a lot that's gone on during COVID that none of us really expected to be be doing still. Here we are in August. Absolutely. I think we're digging deep and finding additional talents. <laughs> Absolutely. So that is an incredibly impressive bio you've got there. And I, I make no qualms about the fact that I'm a huge advocate for women in real estate. So, you know, thank you so much in advance for your time today. Well, thank you for inviting me. And, and honestly, I've listened to some of the, the podcasts you've done uh, so far, and they've been really very interesting. And uh, I think it's it's very interesting to hear about some of these other women in real estate as well. Some of them I know and some of them I don't. So it's always interesting to, to uh, learn more about people and what makes them tick. So. Absolutely. And hopefully along the way, we can help people step up within the industry or get them excited about joining our industry, right? Absolutely. Wonderful. So let's kick off. And uh, my first question for you this morning is how did you actually get your start inside our industry? Well, probably like a lot of others, I fell into the industry. I had just graduated from university and I asked uh, a friend of a friend who was in human resources at the time to take a look at my resume. She gave me a bunch of comments and and um, turns out she actually worked for a real estate company. It was Cambridge Shopping Centers back in the day, uh, now Ivanhoe Cambridge. And um, so she gave me her comments and a few weeks later called me because her company was looking to hire somebody in a contract position for some environmental data entry work. So I interviewed and a few days later I, I started in this role. and. Um, that's where it all began. And you did a bachelor's degree in environmental studies, urban planning. Is that right? Yes, that's correct at, at Waterloo. And I guess that's where she, you know, recalled that I had some sort of environmental background. So it, it made sense for the role that they were looking to hire, which was uh, to basically take some environmental reports uh, with hazardous materials information on a map in a report um, and enter that into their leasing system so that as the leasing uh, teams were doing deals, they would have that information and be able to disclose to the tenant, the potential tenants, what types of hazardous materials were there. So it was a pretty straightforward kind of work, but it was a first job and I was happy to do it, that's for sure. And in that first job, I'm sure there were some valuable lessons learned. So can you share some of them with us? Well, I think, you know, the team that I was working with was a very busy team. It was the equivalent of national operations. And that team was multifunctional. Um, they were, you know, the people on that team were working on environmental management, capital project planning and management. 
They did utility accruals, operating cost disputes with national tenants, bankruptcies, operational statistics, um, like occupancy, sales, and leasing uh, stats, and so on. So, you know, there were so many opportunities for me to jump in and help out if I was willing to. And so I did, because, you know, doing that data entry was it was tough. It was uh, long days of, of sitting there. And, I, you know, I could count how many times I had to hit enter or tab between fields. And, um, you know, the just being in the office and, and hearing all of the, the conversations and things that were going on was such a great opportunity for me to, to learn and sort of suss out uh, different areas that I might be interested in. So I think it's um I think the key word there is just having that willingness isn't it and I think when you sit in an environment you're almost learning by osmosis you know like absorbing you know the information and the knowledge of the people around you and I think that's one of the things you know being out of the office for all of these months you know as much as I personally have loved being home I know not everybody has but I I've loved being home more than I ever have with my kids Um, it's one of the things that makes it very hard in business if you're not physically together and that osmosis that that happens by just being in proximity to people. We had an intern this summer and, uh, you know, it's really hard for them if they haven't worked in an office before to to just pick things up, just basic things on how to use Outlook, how to you know, do a pivot table in Excel, any of these, you know, things that we take for granted, you know, they're trying to learn that. And, and that's the point of, of an internship. So it's, it's been a, it definitely a challenge for sure. Now, you have been involved in a variety of different asset types over the years. Um, can I ask you what your favorite asset has been and why that is? Well, that's very hard to pick one asset because I'll tell you, um, in retail, working in the retail asset class, there's always something going on in every asset. Um, I wouldn't say that I have one favorite because there's so many aspects of what I do that I find so interesting. I think that, you know, uh, working in retail, it's never boring. There's something different every day. It's different from a lot of other asset classes. I've, I've done work um, on office buildings uh, from an asset management standpoint. Um, but, you know, office is a commodity. And from an asset management standpoint, you sort of look at the same things that you would, a lot of the same things that you would in retail, like operating costs and competitive set and managing those costs and so on. But in retail, you need to think about what retailers and uses need to be within the site to make it a better mousetrap, who goes where in the mall, marketing events and promotions. And the metrics aren't just occupancy levels. We have to think about traffic counts, um, dwell times, how do you drive traffic to the mall and keep people there longer, uh, retailer sales performance and margins, affordability, that sort of thing. So I think that, you know, to pick one asset, you know, I've worked on ones that have had major redevelopments and repositionings that have been interesting. I've worked on some very interesting ones in Europe, um, you know, very in small town Germany or in larger cities like Berlin um, that have been, you know, have had all different types of um, challenges, whether it's cultural or leasing or development challenges. And uh, they're all very fascinating. So to pick one would be very hard for me, I have to say. Well, I'm not going to make you pick one then. So we're just going to say that you love them all for different reasons. I do. (laughs) (laughs) No, that's great. Now, I know that you are a lifelong learner and you've invested in yourself over the years um, in order to continue to to learn and grow and, and be the credible expert that you are. So can you talk about some of the ways that you have invested in yourself? Mm -hmm. Um, I think one of the things is that uh, really early on in my career, I I worked for this amazing, uh, very intelligent, hardworking um, gentleman. And um, I had been out of school for about 18 months and I was working on building out some processes and systems to capture data from the sites, um, operating data. 
And I needed to learn more about this. I was sort of stuck. And I went to him and said, how do you think I could do this? You know, I've thought of this, I've thought of that. Um, the technical way to, to capture data in an easy fashion rather than having people emailing spreadsheets back and forth. And he had actually suggested, well, maybe you need to, you know, learn more and go on a course. And I said, well, I have a degree from university. Why do I need to go on a course? And he said, no, no, like, this is going to be a forever thing for you. You always have to continue to learn. And that's one of the many lessons from him. And um, so I found this course and I went to him and I said, with the flight and the hotel and the course cost, it'll be about $3,000. I can't do this. And he said, no, no, you're going. And, you know, I didn't realize the company would pay for this. Wow, this was, you know, so new to me. And so I went on the course and uh, learned so much about how to execute this particular project, gathering this information from the site. And I realized at that point, what a great investment on their part. And I was so lucky to have had that opportunity. From there, I realized that this is why people go to conferences. This is why people network. This is why you have to talk to people and continue to learn. And in our industry, the best way to do that is just simply by being involved. And um, whether that's, you know, through industry specific organizations, attending conferences, um, reading, lots of reading, and um, talking to people, I think is, is some of the, the best ways that you can continue to, to learn. And, and obviously courses, you know, throughout the years, I've taken courses that are some of which are directly related to projects I was working on, whether it's Argus, um, or, um, you know, some sort of environmental courses. But regardless, you have to continue to, to educate yourself. And uh, it's, it's really important. Otherwise, you know, your information becomes stale and uh, you're not exposed to that continual learning mindset. So. Now, I know that you've also done an authentic leadership development program with Harvard Business School. Um, can you just share a little bit more about what that covers and why it was of interest to you and then also how you've applied it in, in your current positions? Okay. Um, so uh, about five years ago, uh, Kingset began a program of sending senior team members to Harvard. We were able to choose any topic, any course, anything that we wanted. And uh, when uh, John Love came to tell me that, uh, you know, they were sending me on this course, he actually suggested I take something unrelated to my daily job function. And I'd already looked at the course calendar and I was looking at negotiation. I was looking at, you know, strategic planning, risk management, all of these things. And he suggested this to me that I do something that was unrelated to my function. So I chose this course it's called Authentic Leadership Development. And it was really appealing to me because I knew that this would for, force me to think about what drives me. Um, you know, you never take the time to stop and think about that. You're always learning skills as opposed to self-reflection. At least that was my case at that point in my life. You know, I had two kids, a husband, a busy job. I was sort of on that hamster wheel. And, you know, to take some time and have that self-reflection, I thought could be interesting. I didn't realize, though, how interesting it would be. Um, you know, you're in a bubble for a week. You're at Harvard. You're staying in the dorms. And with complete strangers, we were in this group of uh, seven. And you're sharing with each other what makes you tick and what you want out of life and, and your career. It's pretty deep to share with strangers. And they're sharing the same information with you about them. And they're also telling you what they see about you. So, it, you know, it's not always, it wasn't always easy, that's for sure, but it was very, very interesting. And, you know, I would say it was probably the most profound experience since becoming a mother. Um, for me, because I just had an opportunity to really think about what I wanted. And one of the things that came out of that for me was I learned that uh, it was really important to me to try and help young people. I didn't know in what way, I didn't know how, but one thing I learned was that I didn't have a lot of career advice when I was in high school. A good friend of mine, her mom helped me make some very big university decisions to choose a program that was interesting and 
specialized rather than going to a school that was known for the great parties in their residence. So, you know, I felt that that was really something that that was going to be important to me. And maybe it was because of the the age um, of my kids at that point in time. But uh, I found that, you know, helping young people was was something that was important to me. And, and when I came back from that course, it really changed how I approach some of my outside activities, I'd say. That sounds like a really life changing program. And I guess stresses the importance of both personal development as well as professional skills training. I mean, it seems from what you've said that the two are inextricably linked anyway. Now, outside of the business, how do you stay connected with the wider audience? Um, I would say, you know, getting involved in different associations. I've been part of ICSC for many years, sat on the planning committee for the Canadian Convention, co-chaired it two years. Um, I've been very involved in the last uh, bunch of years with BOMA Toronto. And, you know, I think that being involved in those organizations, especially a group like Boma Toronto, has helped me learn about the operations side of property management and, and real estate. Um, you know, I sit on uh, the CERMAC committee, which is the security committee um, as part of Boma Toronto. And especially um, during COVID, that's been a fantastic opportunity for me to learn more about people who are, you know, on the ground dealing with Toronto Police Services or, you know, federal agencies and understanding the challenges and issues during this time and to be able to take that and apply it to my assets or or my company has been very uh, fruitful, I would say. So I think that, you know, being part of organizations like that where, you know, not just being a member, but being an active member is really important um, to stay connected to the industry and, and what's going on. Are you looking for a trusted recruiting partner to connect you with people who perform in real estate? At Highview, we partner with some of Canada's leading real estate companies, from national landlords, REITs and service providers, to local developers, third parties and private family businesses. Contact Highview Partners today to discover how we can connect you to people who perform. So despite having carved a successful career in real estate, we all make mistakes at some time or another and experience failure. So can you please share something with us that you have deemed as a failure at the time and what transpired out of that situation? So this is a this is an interesting question. Um, this is something that I think about often. And, um, you know, sometimes we get so focused on wanting something, you know, moving to that next level in our career. And when it doesn't happen or doesn't happen quickly enough, we were upset and frustrated by that. Um, years ago, um, I saw this particular situation as a failure like that, but it was likely a blessing in disguise. Um, my first boss, my mentor that I referred to earlier, he was retiring. And I really wanted to go for his job. And it, I was a director at the time. It was a VP level. Um, and so the interview time was lined up with our COO. I was prepared. Something was nagging at me. I feel like there were things that, you know, I wasn't quite sure if I would like all the parts of his job. He was an engineer and I just thought the world of him. But at the same time, I was thinking, well, it's so technical. And so some of that doesn't really speak to me. And, uh, but, you know, a few hours before the interview, the COO calls me and he says, come to my office right now. And I reminded him, well, the interview is not for four hours. I'm, I wasn't quite done preparing. And he said, no, come now. So I grabbed my stuff and off I go. And he said, what's all that? Anyhow, it doesn't matter what that is. He says, um, listen, one of our largest co-owners has just shotgunned us this morning and we're about to lose some very large assets um, that we had uh, as joint ventures with them. And he said, you have to work on this file. This is the highest priority, like drop everything. And I said, well, I'll see you in a couple of hours for the interview. And he says, I'm not interviewing you. You're not going to get the job anyhow. And thank you for your honesty. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your honesty. And I guess I'll get to work on this stuff. And so off I go. And I was completely devastated walking back to my office. I still remember the feeling walking down the hall. You know, I wasn't getting 
the nod to replace my mentor in a more senior role than I currently had, it was very shocking to me. So I'm working away on this file that he'd asked me to, and, and I'm very engrossed in it. And I sat on the go train that night going home quite late, obviously, because I'd, I'd worked quite late. And I remember thinking to myself, you know what? I really loved what I did today. That was fun. It was interesting. I'm good. And, you know, I think it's about the work that you do and, you know, to not necessarily get caught up in just trying to get to the next level or taking a job that's at the next level just for the sake of it. You have to be passionate about what you do because that's how you do your best work and that's how you will progress. Well, I think he really tested your resilience that day. And, uh, you know, if you can produce, you know, high quality of work under duress like that, then uh, you probably did yourself some favours anyway. (laughs) And And I also think that, you know, you have to realize at some point you need to stand on your own and not just follow in someone else's footsteps just because he was my mentor and that was his job. I could make my own way in a different way, in a different path. Mm. And in terms of learnings from that sort of darker hour, how are you applying that since? Um, I would say that, you know, as opportunities have come along, for me, I've always thought about what the work is going to be, what the culture is going to be. You know, it's not just about the title. Um, it's it's real, the work that you do is important. I, I think that, you know, in that moment, you know, remembering how I was upset, sad, and so on, yet I found solace in doing this very interesting work. Wow. So continue on. And it's a reminder of the fact that you love what you're doing right now, Mm -hmm. which is great. And sometimes that's all we need. It's just a reminder. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Now, inside of your job um, that you're doing now, what puts the fire in your belly and gets you out of bed every day, Teresa, other than three strong coffees? <laughs> um, you know, as an asset manager, you're really a jack of all trades. Um, I touch on so many facets of the business. And that was one of the things that was really appealing to me to move to Kingset uh, about seven years ago was that I knew it was a very lean organization. It was, you know, high producing high pressure, you know, really a fantastic reputation um, as far as the organization and and the senior team goes. And I knew that that would give me an opportunity to continue to touch on all all these facets of the business and in, in such a positive environment. So from my perspective, I wake up every morning and think, what's on, what's on the docket for today? You know, we always have those tasks that we have to do on a regular basis, but there's always something different going on. There's always some sort of movement. And I think that's one of the interesting things is that, you know, we'd rather move forward um, and make a mistake than stand still and, and get nowhere. That's sort of the the mindset that, you know, I have in this environment and, and I really enjoy being um, part of that environment. So, you know, again, partly because I work in the retail asset class, retail is never boring either. So I think that's part of of, um, what gets me out of bed every day. That's great. And for the sake of people listening, do you mind just sharing a little bit more about exactly what you do, like what your responsibilities are at Kingset? Mm -hmm. So um, if you ask my son that question, he would probably tell you it's like flip that house. So you... (laughs) You buy something, you fix it, and you sell it, but we don't always sell. Um, So I think from my perspective, you know, we will look at assets uh, and we'll we'll buy them and we will look to create value uh, while we hold the asset, Um, whether that's a short term hold or a long term hold. We're always looking to create some sort of value. So in the case of retail, you know, we might buy a shopping center that has an empty anchor. So what do you put in there? Is it going to be repurposed as distribution center space, as office space? Maybe you're going to tear down the the old uh, Target store and put residential. Anything like that is is what we would be looking at from an asset management standpoint. But during that time, there's always the, the basic stuff of 
running the real estate, which is making sure it's well leased um, so that you've got some good cash flow, managing your operating expenses, um, you know, looking at the asset from a sustainability standpoint, and is there a way to reduce our, our carbon footprint um, at that particular asset? Is there anything that we need to be doing from a capital standpoint to future-proof the asset? whether that's from, you know, building systems or protecting uh, the building from cyber uh, attacks and, and so on. So there's so many facets of, of what we would look at um, as an asset manager. And, um, you know, in retail, obviously, we're always talking about marketing. How to drive traffic and sales is a, is a big one for us. I noticed actually that up until recently, your job title was SVP of retail, but there's been an, uh, an, an addition to the title of asset resilience. Mm -hmm. Can you just sort of share a little bit more about why this came about? Mm -hmm. So when I started at Kingset uh, back in 2013, um, it was really in our asset management group, we were very siloed into our asset classes. We have a head of industrial retail uh, I was the retail person, uh, office and multifamily. And, um, you know, we all sort of did our own, our own um, asset management. And what came to be was that, you know, sustainability was really uh, having an important um, role in, in dialogue with whether it's investors at the board level or tenants and so on. And because I had that environmental background and I had worked on some sustainability at, uh, in my previous um, position, um, I ended up taking on the sustainability function. Um, so, you know, I've had a director of sustainability working with me since, since then. Um, and um, about a year ago, I had a, a new director start and, um, you know, we, have this program that we built out. We've submitted to GRESB for uh, the, the last five years, six years now. Um, and, you know, we just have built this, this fairly large platform on sustainability. About a year and a half ago, uh, we recognized that smart buildings and prop tech is something that we wanted to uh, wade into. And so we built out a vision for smart buildings and, and um, what did that mean to, to Kingsett and, and so on. And as part of that, we realized we also needed to hire um, for that position as well. So I've had these uh, two directors of sustainability and, and one of building technology as part of my team. And um, that's what we work on and that's across the platform not just in retail so it made sense to sort of have that as part of um, you know a proper functional area um, what those two do is very important um, from a, a sustainability greenhouse gas corporate governance um, you know building technology operating efficiencies and so on is, is really key to, to make sure that we are up to speed, we know what's going on, we're working with our property management teams and also our tenants to implement and um, uh, execute on our vision. And they're also just very sort of cool initiatives to be involved in as well. And it's interesting how you've come full circle from, you know, studying that at university. And now it's sort of prompted you to, you know, pick up this in your current position as well, all those years later. Mm -hmm. Sorry, not not that many years later, Teresa. But a few <laughs> years later. <laughs> so um, in terms of your passions, I mean, you you spoke earlier on about doing the authentic leadership course and realizing that you had a passion for helping young people. Can you sort of elaborate a little bit more on that? Mm -hmm. You know, um, as I said earlier, I didn't really have a lot of um, guidance, I would say, you know, to, to know what it was that I wanted to study in a university. And I finished and thought, you know, I wanted to work as a nonprofit housing development consultant because I, I had done that for uh, a couple of months during a summer uh, work term. And I ended up working in corporate real estate. So there you go. But I think that, um, you know, it, it's become over time something that I've realized that I fell into this, but it must be awfully hard for young people to know where to go and what to do. And, you know, I'm my daughter's in grade, going into grade 12 now. And, you know, just watching how do how they figure that out you know as an adult with experience 
it's hard to watch them try and figure out what it is that they want to do and and where to go and I think that um, that's been something that I've realized is important because not everybody has access to information or to ideas of what careers are out there and um, you know working with some young people that I have worked with it's been very uh, rewarding for me to watch those light bulbs go on and see them say wow I didn't know that there are jobs like that that's interesting I just thought I would be an accountant or I just thought I would be an engineer or I thought I would get a business degree and I don't know what I would do with it so you know to show them that there are these very interesting careers that are available to them and uh, it's a fantastic industry to be in to be part of so and I think it's so important that the associations get involved with, you know, college students and, you know, university graduates just to share the the potential career paths that you can have because it's so diverse and there's something for everybody. And like you say, it's a very exciting and ever changing, fast paced industry um, and how it is when you get into it, it, it's very different sort of so many years later. So there's always something to learn. There's always a new challenge. I think also that, you know, when, you know, these kids are in grade 11 and 12, to even have an idea of where to go and, and what programs that they can look at, I think is really important. And it doesn't mean that, you know, they're going to decide in grade 11 or grade 12 that they want to go into real estate, but to know that that's out there and to go to university and study business or technology or whatever it is that they're going to to study post-secondary and know that there's something else after that that could be um, a, an industry that they could see them in themselves in. And that's why it's so important that those of us who are working in this industry, in whatever capacity that is, that we do our part to advocate for a career in real estate, particularly to those who are at college or university who may just be completely unaware of what the options are. I mean, regardless of your interest or educational background, there really is something in real estate for everybody. So what do you enjoy most about this industry and the people in it? I think that there's something new every single day. Um, I think that there's always uh, some sort of evolution of, you know, whether it's an issue or a concept that we are, are working through, whether it's things like on the security and life safety front, um, especially now with COVID, that is, you know, an area that is so important. Cleaning is another one. Um, is there a way to use technology to help us clean or to give people comfort that something has been cleaned? You know, all, that is something that we didn't really think about 12 months ago, maybe mm. even six months ago, um, because, you know, it's really come to light over the last couple of months. So there's always some sort of evolution. And I think that, you know, I've been so lucky to have some great experiences with very passionate people in this industry. And whether they're retail people, development people, you know, people that work in the office asset class, there's a lot of passion in this industry. And uh, I think that's what's very engaging. And, um, you know, it's, it's great to be around. I, I feed off of that. So I think what we've seen over the last six months is that our industry can be really nimble and adaptable and resilient, which I think is really encouraging. You know, it's actually been really interesting to listen to real estate leaders and to see how quickly they've ensured adaptation to this new world of work and living. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So in terms of your role in the industry, what impact are you working towards creating at this time, Teresa? I think one thing that's really been on my radar for the last couple of years is finding a way to attract young people into the industry. You know, when we look at the people that are running the buildings, whether it's on the technical side, whether it's on the, um, you know, interfacing with the tenant side, leasing and so on, it's hard to attract people to the industry because so many times they don't know about it and they just fall into it. So that's something that um, I've been working, you know, personally and professionally to, to try and attract uh, young people into the industry and show them what it's all about and, you know, get them excited about it. And, and um, hopefully they end up having a great career and uh, bring something great. And, and, you know, that 
um, young thinking to our industry and, and um, so that we can continue to, to evolve. Mm. And, and does that mean that you sort of hire graduates out of university or you, you know, your passion for bringing in interns or, or some other way? Um, so it would be, you know, whether I meet and speak with young people, um, help them introducing, uh, being introduced to, to others. Um, you know, I've had a couple of interns over the last couple of years that I've worked with and, you know, helping them even after they've left and finished off university and have gone on to, to get jobs. So, you know, trying to keep in, in touch with them or if there's young people who are just trying to decide what their next move is, um, whether it's in our industry or not in our industry and explaining to them what this is about, uh, what this industry is about. So um, that's been a, a big uh, focus, I would say, over the last couple of years. For me. Yeah, I think the importance of just having a sounding board, isn't it? Um, mm-hmm. To motivate, encourage, inspire, criticize, whatever it may be. Now, in terms of when you were growing up, um, I'd like to ask you about any significant role models that you've had that, you know, things that you, you learned from them that perhaps you're, you're still applying today? Well, I would say probably growing up, uh, my dad was probably my biggest role model. Uh, he worked very hard. He didn't complain and he just did what had to be done. And, you know, he, my dad worked in the trades and, um, you know, didn't wear a suit to work every day. Um, I don't really know that he knew what I studied in university. Um, <laughs> I, I remember at uh, I bet you our, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I I remember uh, at our at graduation from university, we went out to lunch afterwards, and he said, you know, he made a toast, and he said, I don't know really what this urban planning thing is, but you know, congratulations for graduating. That was that. Um, and so that was you know many years ago, and life marches on. And um, a few years ago, I went to a, a Leafs game with my kids and my, my dad came with us. And after the game, we went into my office building to use the washrooms before the long drive home. And when we came into the office space, um, my son, he walked right into my office. He knew where it was and he took his coat off and he left it on the chair and was going to the bathroom. And my dad said, you can't go in there. Don't take your coat. You can't, you can't just do that. <laughs> and my son said, what do you mean? this is mommy's office. And my dad looked at me very surprised. And he said, you have an office oh, with this kind of view. He was, you know, this view is amazing. He was very surprised. And so, you know, we, the kids, you know, go do their thing and off we go, we get in the car and on the way home, my dad said to me, he said, so what do you do for a living? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, here I am in my early forties telling my dad what I do for a living. And, uh, you know, I was pretty proud to tell him about my job and what I do. And, and, um, it just, it never came up, I guess. And so, you know, it was really, uh, nice for me to be able to, to have that moment. And when I came home, I was telling my husband and he thought, yeah, you, you never really talk about your job, you know, in front of your, your parents. And he said, it must've been quite a shock for him. And I said, I, I think it might've been. So it was, it was really nice um, to have that for sure. But, you know, you said that you're, you're proud to tell him, but he must've been incredibly proud to know, you know, that you had studied so hard and gone on to have such a successful career. Either that or he thinks that you sit in your office daydreaming out the window looking at the view <laughs> and get paid well for it. <laughs> well, I think that, you know, from, you know, knowing how my dad always worked and never complained and, and so on. And my sister and I are very lucky to be in the spot that we are because of, of you know, his dedication and hard work. And, and obviously my mom as well, you know, sacrifices that, that she made. So I think that that's something, you know, from my perspective, I... I know the hard work and the sacrifice. So I think of that, you know, when I'm frustrated or tired or, or, you know, um, you know, wanting to, you know, pack it in for the end of the day and you think, you know what, it's okay. Like keep going. Now we're going to end with um, asking for some advice from you. And that would be, what would you share for someone who's looking to raise their game within our industry? You know, I think you can't be afraid to try something different. 
if you're successful or not, it doesn't matter, you'll learn something. And so I think that's something that, you know, people need to be okay to step outside of their comfort zone and, and try something different. That's the, the only way we grow. No, that's really, really great sound advice. Okay, so now for the really, really fun part. Um, and I want an opportunity for us to, to get to know you better, Teresa. So I'm going to just fire some of these rapid fire type questions at you. Are you ready? <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> okay, so if you could have any job in the world, what would it be? I, I think back uh, to a wonderful woman in our life, um, about 20 years ago, uh, she was an adoption facilitator. And what an amazing and rewarding job that would be. I'm sure there's heartbreaking parts of it as well, but I only remember the good. So what a, that would be a fantastic job for me. (laughs) Uh, Amazing. If you could have a superpower, what would it be and why? Oh, this is easy. I always say this um, because I would love to be able to fly so I wouldn't have such a long commute. <laughs> Me too. I've I've always had these amazing dreams where I'm up, you know, with these beautiful aerial views and I'm an eagle and it's just like, but yeah, not getting rid of that commute would be so nice. What's your favorite summer activity? Honestly, only since this summer, I would say that it's morning walks. Um, I, I, I have never done that before. I always would, you know, be rushing, rushing to the gym, rushing to go for a run, but I've taken the time to actually walk and it's quite lovely. So I've enjoyed that this summer. Amazing. What's your favorite hobby? Oh, hmm. so I like synchro skating. You like what? Synchronized skating. Oh my gosh. Is that a thing? Yeah, it's a thing. <laughs> I did it as a kid and I started doing it again as an adult. That's awesome. I knew that there was synchronized swimming, but I've never heard of synchronized skating. Yeah. What is one thing that annoys you the most? <laughs> These are all almost easy. That's um, when I have to ask my kids to do something more than once. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's when they step over the laundry coming up the stairs. But it doesn't even <laughs> exist. What is um, one of your weird quirks? Mm. Apparently, I talk with my hands even when I'm on the telephone. (laughs) I have been as we've been talking today. And if you could go anywhere in the world right now, where would you go and why? Well, the summer of 2020 uh, is my parents' 50th wedding anniversary. And uh, we were all to go to Italy, to my dad's hometown. So... Back in March, we had to cancel that, and uh, I wish we could all go. Um, I was really looking forward to, to going with, with the family and uh, seeing this, uh, not just in pictures. So that's where I would go. Next year, hopefully. Hopefully. Fingers crossed. Teresa, I have to say this has been fantastic. It's been interesting. You have shared so many inspiring stories. It's been knowledgeable. You offer great advice and I'm so thankful for your time today. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to People Who Perform, the real estate careers podcast brought to you by Highview Partners, a talent search and recruitment firm focused exclusively on Canadian real estate. If your real estate team is looking to find the best next hire, or if you're ready to make the best next move in your career, then reach out to Highview Partners today. Follow us on LinkedIn and visit us at highviewpartners.ca.